Hello, um, I was teaching some physician associate students this week. We've been doing a, a neuro block split over Christmas and we were talking about the spinal cord and I realised that while we've talked about tracts and stuff in the past, we've never talked about the basics of the spinal cord. So what I'm talking about, what I want to talk about is if you cut a section through the spinal cord, what is it that you're looking at? What is white matter? What is grey matter? What are those bits of grey matter? And what are those bits of white matter? That's it, right? Um, we've talked about spinal nerve roots in the past. I don't want to talk about the connective tissues. I don't want to talk about the blood supply. There's so much fascinating, well-organized anatomy that I could go on forever. So we'll just look at the fascinating, well-organized anatomy that is the spinal cord, all right? So if you cut a section through the spinal cord, you see this very familiar, maybe, shape. There's a butterfly in the center of this, of this oval shape. In fact, the, the, the spinal cord um, changes as we descend, right? Okay. Like I said, I just want to talk about a section, but in adults it stops about here and then the spinal nerves that come out of it flow down the vertebral foramen and out and what have you. But anyway, up here the spinal cord is bigger and down here the spinal cord is smaller. And it has a couple of bulges. It has a, it, it, it's thicker here and it's thicker here. Why would that be? We'll find out. Okay, a couple of terminology bits and bobs just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, anatomically, we call this anterior and this posterior, so anterior and posterior. Um, but when we're talking about neuroanatomy, we'll also often talk about ventral and dorsal. We do the same thing in the embryo because the embryo is curved and it makes, easier, it makes it easier to talk about these two surfaces as it curves around without getting confused. In, in human neuroanatomy, the, the the central nervous system goes up like that and then it folds over so we keep this this ventral dorsal thing anyway when we talk about the spinal cord then we often say dorsal when we're talking about the posterior aspect and one of the distinguishing features of the dorsal spinal cord if you have enough bits and bobs is that we have the this lump here this is the dorsal root ganglion so this is dorsal, this is anterior. To be honest, with the section, it would be very difficult to tell what's left and right. We could, well, we could assume lots of things, but it's difficult to tell. But this is dorsal and this is ventral. So then this butterfly shape here, this is the gray matter. We've got kind of what looks like wings on either side. It's surrounded by the white matter. So the gray matter is embedded into the white matter, forming this oval shape. Um, so we've got some features here that we need to talk about. We've got some features and shapes here that we need to talk about. So if we cut through the spinal cord at any level, we'll see white and gray matter. It'll look white and it'll look gray. Same with the brain. If we cut a section through the brain, we'll see gray bits and white bits. Now, what are those gray bits and white bits? Well, um, myelin. So, a neuron is a cell that has a cell body, like other cells, and it has some dendrites, some little processes sticking out of it, maybe. But then it'll often have a, an axon coming from it, a very long, thin, tubular axon. It could be very long, if you think about blue whales and dinosaurs, and giraffes and stuff um, or it could be a very short little interconnecting neuron going from one to another um, so it should, could be a short axon but if the axon is traveling a long way and if that actual axon is, is conveying an action potential an electrical impulse that action potential can be conveyed more quickly if the axon is insulated What's the body's insulator? Fat. So, so an axon traveling a long way will be surrounded by Schwann cells making fat called myelin, which looks white. So when you're looking at white matter, you're looking at bundles of axons. You're not looking at the nerve cell bodies, you're looking at their axons that are being sent some distance. So whether we see that in the spinal cord or in the brain, so if you look at a section in the brain and you see a white section, that means there are neurons running from one place to another, not collections of cell bodies. So what's this gray matter then? Well, 
Grey matter is typically the cell bodies of the neuron that the axon's coming from. Um, and the other thing to consider is that if you want to make a connection between neurons, then you don't want any insulator there, do you? You don't want any fat. So where we see grey matter, we're also seeing connections between the axon of one neuron meeting often the cell body of another neuron. So this is where we're seeing synapses. This is where we're seeing connections. And that's an important idea. Both of those things are important ideas. So the gray matter in the spinal cord is where we're seeing nerve cell bodies and we're seeing connections. And it's the same up in the brain. If you see gray matter, this is where neurons are starting from, which is where their cell bodies are from. These are usually the bits of interest. So when we look at a section through the spinal cord, when we're looking at the white matter, we're seeing neurons coming down from the brain, running down the spinal cord. And then they will connect with more neurons in the gray matter. So the cell body will be in there. And then either the neuron will send an axon out to a target motor structure, a muscle, or a neuron will come in from a sensory structure and connect and then go up the spinal cord back to the brain. That's why those concepts are so important. And okay, what about the shapes that we can see here? So I said this was dorsal and this was ventral. And what we see then, if this is the, the spinal nerve, we see these rootlets. And this here, this would be the dorsal horn. And the dorsal horn is receiving sensory neurons. So the dorsal root ganglia is a sensory ganglion. It's, this is a collection of nerve cell bodies here as well, of, of peripheral nerves. So the nerve cells are sending sensory information back into the dorsal horn of the gray matter of the spinal cord, and then they will connect with neurons. So a second neuron, we call them second order neurons, in the white matter, which will run up the spinal cord, typically to the thalamus dorsal horn. So guess what this bit's called? This is the ventral horn. Now in the ventral horn we have motor neurons. So we'll have a motor neuron, so you're, you'll have motor neurons coming down from the brain. These will be your upper motor neuron. The, the, uh, the neuronal cell body will be up in the cerebral cortex. It'll send an axon down the spinal cord in the white matter and then at whichever level it needs to it will connect with a second motor neuron in the ventral horn of the gray matter, and that's your lower motor neuron, which will then carry that action potential out through these ventral rootlets to join the spinal nerves and carry off around the body. Easy, right? So tell me, why does the spinal cord get smaller as we descend, as we run inferiorly or caudally towards the tail? And why do we have a bulge, a bulging, an increase in thickness of the spinal cord up here and down here? If the white matter is made up of neurons running up and down the spinal cord and meeting with another neuron which is then going to run out of the spinal cord, you're going to have lots of those neurons running up and down the spinal cord up here, but as we get more caudal as we run inferiorly, most of those neurons have met another neuron and done their job. So that bundle of neurons or those bundles of neurons get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller as we run inferiorly because down here there are only a few more connections left to be made. Does that make sense? So that's why up here the spinal cord is much thicker and down here it's thinner. It's because the white matter is getting used up. The connecting neurons have done their job, so down here there are fewer of those neurons in the tracts. What about the grey matter then? Okay, so grey matter are neuronal cell bodies and connections. And up here, the bulge, and here, the bulge in the, in the spinal cord, if we look at those sections, we'll see more grey matter. So the grey matter is making the whole spinal cord bulge. Why is there more grey matter up here? Why would there be? <laughs> it's, it's because of the limbs. So here, 
the nerves, the peripheral nerves are going to run to the limbs and also down here the peripheral nerves are going to run to the lower limbs and you might have noticed that your the skin on your fingers is incredibly sensitive so that means with increased sensitivity you must have more axons so you've got more Dense, a higher density of sensory apparatus here. More sensory apparatus means more neurons, means more axons, means more connections, right? Also, you've got this interesting collection of muscles in your upper limb. And um, particularly with the fine movement of the muscles with the fingers, um, you can have one neuron that innovates a motor unit, a whole bunch of, of muscle cells. But it tends to be that the the, the, the finer the movement that the muscle allows, the more neurons per muscle cell innovate that muscle. So you've also got lots of connections for the muscles. So that's why you've got a bulge here, because there's more grey matter, there are more connections because of the upper limbs, and likewise down here. Isn't that cool? Okay, those are some really core, key, important concepts to grasp. And I know what neuroanatomy is like. If you don't grasp the core concepts, you then tend to struggle with the other bits. Um, the other bits that would grow from this is that um, while we name the bits of the grey matter, um, there is also a lateral horn in the grey matter here, but only in the thoracic levels and the upper lumbar levels. And what we see here is this is where the the neurons of the sympathetic nervous system come from. They come from the lateral horn and they run out through the ventral horn, through these ventral rootlets and, and pass on to, to form the sympathetic chain and whatnot. So that's a little add-on. In the grey matter you can also see that there's a central canal. This is continuous with the, uh, the ventricles within the brain, so we have CSF in here. Um, and also you can see that the left and right sides of the grey matter are connected here. But we also know that the white matter, ventral to the grey matter, is also a connection between the sides. This is how some of the nerves will cross from one side of the body to the other. And this gets called the ventral uh, white commissure, a commissure being a connection. And this grey connection then between the two sides might get called the, the grey commissure. Um, if you come across the term fasciculus, um, that also just means a bundle of axons tied together within the central nervous system. You don't get thrown by that, so tract, fasciculus, a tract is also a bundle of axons. Um, those words mean the same thing. Um, a tract of neurons outside the central nervous system, so in the peripheral nervous system, would just be called a nerve. Right? Um, and in the white matter, if we look at the axons here and see where they're going, we see that they are indeed bundled together and going to similar places. And I won't go into too much detail now, maybe a little bit of labelling, but we see this region here, these are the dorsal columns, and we can see those being described as layers as well, but dorsal columns is often enough. We see spinothalamic tracts carrying sensory information back to the thalamus. We see uh, corticospinal tracts running from the cortex down the spinal cord. So these are carrying upper motor neurons, um, which will help innovate the skeletal muscles. And we see spinocerebellar tracts running up to the cerebellum, which help with proprioception and movement and that sort of thing. And many more, and in more and more detail if you look hard enough. Likewise, with the grey matter, although we tend to talk about the dorsal and ventral horns, you'll also see descriptions of the grey matter being kind of sliced up into layers and, and regions and described in that way. It, you know, it's like any anatomy. Um, we like to describe it in as much detail as we can. The last two things to describe would be these lines here separating the left and right sides of the spinal cord, as it were. Uh, ventrally or anteriorly, there is often a pretty decent gap, whereas posteriorly, not so much. So this gets called the dorsal median sulcus, because median is in the midline, uh, and this one here gets called the ventral median fissure. Of course, this is massively enlarged because this has all got to pass through the vertebral foramen in the vertebrae. So we're thinking really something that size, or in fact a bit smaller, because it's also surrounded in blood vessels and the three layers of, of piamater, arachnoidmater, duramater, CSF, all that sort of stuff, right? I wonder if I've got any sections of the spinal cord which we could look at under the microscope.
Okay, there you go then. Uh, hopefully that was useful. Maybe it was brief, kind of doubt it. Um, worth doing though, I think. See you next time. <laughs>